You're listening to The Unpaved Path, a podcast made to inspire and motivate the next generation of athletes to own their journey. My name is Reagan Rust. I'm a former captain of Boston University's NCAA Division I women's ice hockey team and current professional hockey player in Stockholm, Sweden. I'm talking with athletes, people in the sports industry, and sports supporters to share their journeys and the lessons they learned along the way. If you're looking to hear a real Boston accent, my guest today is your guy. He's a former college baseball and ice hockey player from Massachusetts and has a famous dad that many of you know as the captain of the 1980 Olympic ice hockey team, aka Mike Ruzioni. I love this episode today because it talks about some big parts of sports that aren't usually discussed like athletes feeling pressure from parents to excel, dealing and pushing through injuries, and how men deal with mental health issues. Paul brings a wealth of knowledge, experience, and reflection through his journey with sports and beyond. Whether you're a parent, athlete, or someone experiencing a mental health battle, I think everyone can take away something from this episode. If you want to follow along on Paul's journey, he can be found on Instagram at P underscore Eruzioni. Paul, thank you so much for being on today. I'm sorry I called you your dad's name earlier. (laughs) It wouldn't be the first time. Don't worry about it at all. How's life going for you? I can't complain. Um... You just met my fiance briefly when we were getting this set up. We just got engaged about a month ago. Uh, and, you know, other than that, you know, working and living, playing some golf. Other than that, I can't complain. <laughs> yeah, you guys are always on the boat or grilling out or hanging out with each other. It's, it's, awesome the, summer, it's the summertime. A lot of big family. We all live around the same block. My parents live behind me. So uh, we're always over there. We, we got nephews and nieces and cousins and all that we're a big family group so we always want to get together when the weather's nice yeah for sure I mean especially in Boston haven't you guys had a lot of gloomy days recently uh so it's it's August 1st today I believe uh so that the first 17 days of January I mean I'm sorry July we had 15 days of rain and only two (laughs) of not rain and it was it was actual and it was actual rain not like a little drizzle it was like uh it was biblical Oh my goodness. Well, yeah. I'm glad you guys are getting together now and you have sunshine so you can go to your dad's pool. <laughs> oh, I know. We just put the gate in. I, I put that on uh, Instagram, my Instagram story the other day. We installed the gate so I don't have to walk around the block. God forbid. I got to walk a little bit extra, but easy <laughs> access. Well, now you can't complain at all. It's right there. Exactly. Um, so anyways, you have played sports your entire life. Basically your whole family has, right? Like you guys yep. grew up playing together. Um, what was that experience like, especially being in the big family? Was it super competitive? It was always competitive. I mean, it always started out, uh, you know, my brother was the oldest. He's uh, My brother's four years older than me. I'm 33 right now. Uh, but we were kids. My two cousins lived two houses up from um, my parents' house where I grew up. Across the street was my other cousin, his younger sister. Uh, down the block was another, he wasn't family, but he was considered, he was a, the adoptive cousin because he was so close and he was in our age group. Uh, two blocks away from there was another cousin. So we played sports that are your, your traditional sports, wiffle ball, stick ball, uh, street hockey. Uh, but then we also, you know, we, we played games like half ball. We'd cut a tennis ball in half and get it at the end of a broomstick. <laughs> We'd, uh, we'd play this game called Off the Steps where we would have the steps up to our, our mother's front door. And, you know, we made lines out of, the, we made rules out of the cracks in the street where if you hit it beyond that line to be a single or a double, or if you hit it in the bushes across the street at the Johnson house, that's a home run. Uh, I mean, we, we literally played everything you could ever imagine. We, the only thing we did, I don't think we ever played growing up was soccer. But we played tackle football up the street at Thornton Park where, we, and it, where now I walk my dogs and, um, when we weren't in school, we were, we were playing something. We never really played like uh, Cowboys and Indians or anything like that. We were, we were playing something that had scores or teams or something. And that's just something that, I mean, if my father was on the interview with me. He said the same thing about his family growing up. Uh, his aunts and uncles were always in the backyard. Aunts were keeping score. His brother, they were doing the same thing. Somebody was dubbed the goalie and, and you know, that's just how it went. And we kind of took after them. Yeah, I mean, you got to know who won, right? So you had to get a score. You, when you went in, when you went in for the the Sunday uh, dinner with the Italian family, yeah, over spaghetti and meatballs, you had to say who lost and who won, and you know, you'll see you next week. Yeah, seriously, well, that's <laughs> awesome. So yeah. you, what were your main sports growing up? Uh, growing up, 
uh, when I was younger, before high school, I played football, hockey, and baseball. Uh, Winthrop was a very small town. We never had um, the funds in the town to have the sports like lacrosse. Uh, again, like I said, soccer wasn't very big in our town. Uh, we're mainly a football and hockey town, but my father played baseball his whole life, so he got me into that when I was real young. And I had an uncle um, who passed away when I was in prep school, but he would take me and my other cousins down the baseball field and we'd shag fly balls for hours uh, and then ride down the street on our bikes and get ice cream. But the, the main sports were, were hockey and baseball for me. Football I played and just I never played when I got to high school, but um, hockey and baseball were basically my life, my life. On the ice and off the ice for, for hockey, we play in the backyard, on, not on... Uh, we never played on rollerblades. We played on sneakers. So I guess that's where we, we learned our footwork. Yeah. Do you think your dad wanted you to play hockey more than anything because of his legacy? Um, he never he never put the pressure on me. Um, as much as I think I felt pressure from it, he never told me I needed to do something. He just always would say that, you know, there's nothing worse than wasted talent. And a lot of athletes have heard that. And not just athletes, but, you know, uh, anybody who had the ability to do anything, whether it's academics or or a craft or an art or something like that, you know, you, you never wanted to throw that away. And my dad was the same way. Um, he would always say that I was one of the better athletes in my family, just because, again, going back to when we were younger, we played every every sport, and um, I excelled at a lot of things. I did. I did everything from I did gymnastics. I did uh, uh, break dancing, like all these things. I had my toes dipped in every type of pool you could imagine. But when it came to hockey, he just wanted to make sure that I was one, having fun, and two, I was I was playing to the best of my ability. If I didn't want to do it, uh, he wouldn't. He would never force me. You know, it's never like that type of deal where he had me in the backyard. You know, taking slap shots for hours on end in the pouring rain, like you see in, in some movies and stuff. He was never the overbearing parent, but he just wanted to make sure that I was going to go out there and and want to play and be able to play at the, the, the top of my, my capabilities. Mm -hmm. Well, that's amazing considering like, obviously everyone knows who your dad is and you know, like there's a lot of hockey parents nowadays and even just like sports parents in general that will like literally force their kids to uh, the, one of the people I had the, on the podcast, he made his son go into the garage and he said he couldn't go inside until he could get past him because he wouldn't body check. Yeah. Like, I mean, I've, I've, I've played and I played hockey in different states for, for select teams and local teams, prep school teams, college teams, all that. And we've heard, my, my dad has told me through the grapevine, you know, parents coming up to him asking about if their kid was going to be able to play in the NHL. And here we are as, at 11 years old at McDonald's after a hockey tournament down in Martha's Vineyard. And my dad, you know, he, he never wanted to discourage anybody. But at the end of the day, I mean, he he knew that it was it was there's so much more to athletics than just the one sport you're playing. You know, like I said, we, we had played in ice where we'd have a hockey game, we'd go in the backyard and we'd play uh, basketball, me and my father, you know, just to kind of break up the monotony of, you know, traveling for a weekend, playing a double ahead of Saturday and Sunday and then being exhausted. But to, to remember to be a kid, to enjoy life and not just focus on, you know, lacing up the skates or, or, or the cleats or whatever it may be. He, he always made sure that, again, you want to be happy with what you're doing. If you, if you start to drill it in these kids' heads nowadays, they're going to get burnt out before they even have the opportunity to play at the next level. And that, mm -hmm. that's happening far too often nowadays than it was when I was a kid. And I feel for so many of these kids nowadays, because it's not just – if you play one sport, you're going to be great at that sport. But if you play multiple sports, you're going to add skills into that one sport that you love the most based on playing, um, I mean, baseball, you know, hand-eye coordination and hockey. Yeah, your feet do one thing, but your hands do another thing. It's like football players that take um, dance lessons so they can get stronger in their legs. You got, you, yeah, like there's football players and hockey players that, that do multiple other sports, to, you know, to strengthen their core or certain muscles or, you know, get them stronger on their feet or to use different muscles that you never think would make you better at one particular sport. But I mean, the more you do, the, the more round you're going to be. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, 
I mean, I've seen it so much, even in the girls that I've been coaching where they're like, yeah, I just got done with soccer practice and I had three hours of ice this morning. I'm like, you already had three hours of ice time and you just ran probably like six miles in practice. Yep. You should not be here right now. Like that is so bad for you. Yeah. Um, it's super frustrating too. Cause like a lot of parents don't get that aspect. Maybe because like they want their kids to be the best, but like that's not how you make your kids the best. Like they should want to do it themselves. Yeah. But hey, what's the term? They call them helicopter parents where they're, they're, you know, they're always hovering they're watching everything and, I mean, I mean, I, I could never, I, I would never try to judge anybody in, in their situation because it's not my life and I, I would never try to, you know, tell them how to le- raise their children or whatnot. But like, I, it's, again, it's always, it always boils down to having a good time. You know, if the kid's mm-hmm. afraid of finishing a hockey game and not scoring five goals and he's going to get back home, he's going to get reprimanded that he didn't play good enough. Oh, that, that's that shame on the parents. You know, the kids just out there to have a good time. It's not about winning losing at that level you know winning and losing isn't going to make you professional it's just about being good at what you do and not getting burnt out like I said Mm -hmm, definitely well I'm sure we could talk about this problem for hours because there's so much that goes into it but um we'll get back to you know you did a post-grad year and you went to prep school um it was Berkshire and what was that experience like for you leaving home especially because you love your family so much so it was going into my senior year, I knew before I even made the decision to go to Berkshire that there was going to be a decision that was going to need to be made of what sport would I want to pursue, hockey or baseball, if not both. Um, would I want to do prep school? Because Winthrop is such a small town. We're a square mile. We have about 20, 22,000 people. Actually, probably a little, probably closer to 20, if not a little less. 22,000 people. Uh, again, we're a, we're a more of a football town, at, at least when I was in high school, than a hockey town. Um, but, you know, trying to figure out if I wanted to take that extra year to be seen. Uh, not, to, I mean, a lot of people say, like, you know, if you're good enough, you can be seen, which I, I agree to, I agree with to a degree, but at the same time, you know, how, how many times is some scout or somebody going to get a call? Hey, you know, that small town went up right outside Boston where the, all the airplanes fly over. They got this one kid who might be able to play at your school. Um, my dad thought it'd be a good idea because I was on a small side. My growth birth came at my, I'd probably say the end of my senior year. And, and I was, I mean, I was, my freshman year, I was 5'3", 117 pounds. I was teeny. Uh, then my senior year, I probably it up to maybe five six 140 so I was I was still in like the peak of my growing stage so I needed to make sure that I could you know get to my growth spurt be able to play at a level where I would be able to be compared to other people who might be in a conversation of who they want to take first who they might think would fit in better spot here or there so I decided to go to prep school because I had some friends that were going to Berkshire and they said, you know, you know, you're going to play some hockey here. The baseball team wasn't so good out there. But at this point, I probably thought I had a better chance of playing hockey in college. I liked baseball more. Um, but it was just it was just a decision that I think was, I don't want to say pressured in by outside sources, not so much my family, but about friends that went to prep school. My brother went to Phillips Andover, and he said he had a great time. Unfortunately, he ran into the same types of problems with injuries that I did. But... Um, I just remember, I remember driving through the tunnel just outside the airport on my way and I was second guessing my decision, but it was kind of one of those things. All right, you know, let's just make the best of it. And I got there and I was having fun. Um, and then just kind of think with with injuries, things kind of spiraled out of control. I'll tell you right now, I wish I never went to prep school, but I don't think I got what I should have got out of it because, um, Again, after I got hurt so early in the year, I think I just kind of shut myself out to what the experience of prep school life was. Um, but again, if I if had to do it all over again, I'd probably I'd probably go back to prep school again because when I got there is when I got to my strongest. I got some looks, um, but I mean that's that's just my own my own personal journey. I know guys that probably would have went immediately to college regardless of what their outside influences were. But at the time, I, you know, I made a decision and I just got, you know, I'll live with it and that it is what it is. Mm-hmm. 
So you said you got injured. When did you get injured and how specifically? So at Berkshire, and I think a lot of prep schools are like this, you have to do three activities, not necessarily just sports. Um, but the in the fall season, I, I tried to play football, actually, because I worked, I went to a, a hockey camp, um, at, uh, NHT, I forget the, what it actually stood for, I was up in Southern New Hampshire University, and the um, off-ice trainer was a football coach at prep school at Berkshire, and he said, hey, you know, I'd love for you to play, base, uh, play football for me, uh, if we can make it happen, but you're only allowed to take so many PGs. Uh, postgraduate so I missed the cut so I ended up doing crew so we did some rowing um I only did it because I've never I've never rowed a boat other than a canoe in my entire life um but it it, it kept you in shape it was kind of com it was competitive and that was just my my upbringing where I could have played like third soccer or JV soccer and just went out there and screwed around but um I knew that this was a big year for me as I stated before you know I want to get looks so I'm not going to waste five months, three, three months out of the season to just kind of screw around where I can develop myself more. Um, so in, in, in a long story short, what the doctor eventually told me was uh, my, my core got too strong, I like got too tight. And uh, without the proper um, coaching, not, not necessarily blaming my coaches, but uh, not being familiar with like the uh, the motion of rolling a boat and stuff like that, my upper body was pulling a lot more on my my groins and my adductor muscles and my hip flexors, and I developed a small tear on my right groin, and it kind of started to progress a little bit more, and I knew hockey season was approaching, so I decided to get cortisol shots, and. That, that was just, you know, that's a quick fix. And that's a whole other story about everybody wants a quick fix. You know, you think it's going to be work out for your benefit. Um, so I got the cortisone shot. I, I rode a couple of races. We did, uh, you know, the, the team did ahead of a Charles. I didn't row the head of a Charles, but we did a, the Housatonic River out in Connecticut. So I got the, I got my season out of the cruise season. And I was in, I was in phenomenal shape, you know. I probably added 20 pounds when I went to prep school from when I graduated, went through. I was just working out. I was 18 years old. I was working out and eating as a 20, 18 year old guy would do or a kid, whatever you want to say. Um, and I was, I wasn't there to not necessarily, I don't want to say I wasn't there to make friends, but I was there to, you know, get the job done, do what I needed to do, work out, be active, be productive. And it ended up kind of nipping me in the butt a little bit because I, couldn't take the chance of, you know, bowing out for a month or two. And as time went on and the hockey season, it got worse and worse. And then one day when the cortisone wore off, uh, kind of all the hell broke loose, I guess you could say. And what did you do when that happened? So when that happened, um, this is where I, I kind of went into a fight or flight mode, I guess you could kind of say, where I just decided to fight and, um, again, going back to when we were growing up, you know, when we would be playing tackle football up at the park of the street and, you know, we'd come back and there'd be shirts ripped and bloody noses and scuffed knees and stuff like that. But we would sit down at the table and we'd be fine. You know, nobody was hurt. Uh, if, if we got up, we, we, we played the next play, then you, you were fine. You could keep going. So I carried that mentality and I still kind of do it, you know, in my stubbornness. Um, but when, when the cortisone shots wore off, we were at a hockey tournament. We were about two months into the hockey season. It was December. And we were at the Avon Christmas tournament. And the cortisone shot wore off. And I remember I woke up to get out of bed. The Friday we got there, we had like a pregame skate. We had a pregame meal. We had a game that Saturday morning. I woke up. And um, it wasn't even like a numbing pain. It was a throbbing I, I mean, of like a vibration, I guess you could say, like all my tendons, my joints, everything from my lower belly button down to midway through my thighs. It was black and blue. It was blemished. You no, know, it looked like it looked like kind of a rash with a little bit of blotty, uh, uh, black and blue in certain spots. So I just thought, I mean, okay, let me get out of bed. Let me see if I can stretch it off. You know, maybe I did something the day before. Maybe I, I pulled a groin or whatnot. Just the something subtle. 
and I realized that I, it was it was struggling to walk, so I just kind of stretched it out, and I, you know I popped a couple of Tylenol, and when I say a couple, I mean probably way too many that I should have, but uh, you know I had to play the game. It was against my my best friend from Winthrop. His team was Avon, and you know if if I bought out of this game, I was going to hear from him for the rest of my life. And we did our pregame warm up, uh, like running around the track and whatnot. And I realized it was hurting pretty bad. So I got some hockey tape and I just, I, I taped up my, my groins, almost like, like a jock strap would be, you know, as tight as I could, as evenly as I could, just to kind of, you know, you put pressure on a wound. So that's what I did. And um, I remember I, I said this to you in our previous conversation that, you know, I was taping up my uh, shin pads and I remember I pulled the tape off and I remember there was the, the most awkward, um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, can't even put words to the pain that it was. It, it shot all the way from my, my, my groin, all the way up to my lower back, to my belly button. It was just like a shock to the system. And I knew my, my dad drove down for the game. You know, my, my buddy's parents were down there. So he drove down to Avon. And he was in the front lobby and I walked out half dressed and he, uh, he was like, hey, what's up, Paul? What's going on? You know, you ready? And if he was here, he could tell you the look on my face. He knew that there was something wrong. And I, I looked at him and, you know, I said, excuse my language. I know there's people watching this, but I said, dad, I feel like somebody's kicking me in the balls. And he kind of chuckled. He goes, what do you mean? I go, I don't know, dad, something's wrong. And then there was that. It was just as simple as that. You know, the, the Zamboni was finishing, you know, we had to play and he goes, okay, go see the trainer. Tell him, tell him what you just told me. I obviously didn't go to see the trainer, uh, but my coach happened to walk out to the lobby and I guess my dad grabbed him and told him what I said. And so he came back to the locker room and he asked me if I was okay. I said, yeah, of course, you know, just whatever, you know, maybe pregame jet is a little butterflies, whatever. And so I played that game. I don't remember the, if there was any pain or anything like that. I think, I think the adrenaline was still, driving me through it at this point so early on in the injury um but I remember after the game in the showers it, it I, I wish I had a chair to sit down it, it got to that point where it wasn't just you know one spot it was it was completely debilitating and this went on for I don't know two months you know taping up my legs taking you know 10 Tylenol a day just, you know, because I, I would, I didn't want to, you know, do maybe Percocets or anything like that. You know, I'm not going to stop making those types of phone calls. And it, it would, if I went to see a doctor, I knew that they would tell me I wasn't going to be able to play. And uh, every day I would go to bed, I had the conversation in my head, should I tell somebody or am I going to ruin my chances of going to play, you know, at a BU, at a Northeastern or, or, or wherever it may be, St. Mike's, I was at St. A's. I was, I was talking to certain coaches after certain, certain games before I got hurt. And they said, you know, the same thing, keep playing like this. And, you know, maybe we'll have a conversation at the end of the year and you can play for us. So there was that, you know, I'm not hurt factor every single night before I went to bed. But there was also the little pot in the back of the head that said, no, Paul, you're, you're hurt. Um, so this went on again, like I said, for a couple of months. And then just one day I said, okay, I need to get this. I need to get this looked at. And we went, we traveled. I went, I went to LA. I went to Atlanta. Uh, I went to New York city, went to Boston. Uh, I saw probably six different doctors. Um, I don't know, 10 different physical therapists, all these people, dissectionists, masseuses, trying to figure out what this was. And my local physical therapist that I saw all the way through high school when I, you know, would, you know, separate my shoulder, this, this, this local guy who's been a family friend forever, he took it upon himself to do his research because when I would see these doctors, they thought I was, they thought I was making this up. You know, they thought when I said, if I rolled over in bed, that it hurt so bad that I would, I would wake up in agony that they just thought it was a mental thing. So it got to that point too, where I would be telling myself, you know, is it, is it just me? Am, am I making up th these problems? You know, is, is that that tweak when I move my, when I stand up out of my desk? Is that just me, you know, be, being a wimp? You know, what, what's going on? So I started to get real frustrated and angry with, with people. Um, 
people as, as these doctors that I was seeing, these people that are supposed to help me that now are telling me that I'm lying or, or maybe it's not as bad as, as I'm making it out to be. But back to Kevin, the, the guy in town, he found out that it was a very rare, or at least in its infancy, infancy, now it's a very popular injury, is the sports hernia. So that's, that's how it happened to me at the very beginning. It started with a small tear, then it turned to a sports hernia, then a double sports hernia. And we found a guy in Philadelphia who decided to do orthoscopic surgery. And you know, he put a couple holes in and a little camera and come to find out that that small tear that happened in the cruise season, after the cortisone shots, my body started to compensate my right side, side to, my left side started to compensate for my right side. And what turned out to be a small groin tear and a small abdominal tear turned out to be two torn lower abdominal, uh, abdominals, two torn groins, two torn abductors, two torn hip flexors, and my right upper femur, literally he said, started to decay and roll off of my femur. Uh, my quad muscles started to roll off my femur. So he's telling me this and and then I, 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 was, I was in shock and awe. My mother and my father were sitting in the room with me. And I kind of, I remember I kind of smiled. I looked at my dad, like, I almost wanted to like brag. Like, what? Like, that was really going on that whole entire time. That's what that was. But then, then the, 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 the heat and the wave of emotion kind of set in like, you know, holy crap, this is, this is, this is legitimate. You know, this isn't just, you know, uh, a sprained groin or a rolled ankle or, or a dislocated shoulder. I've dislocated my shoulders playing baseball in high school. That was a, you know, a couple week rebound. And um, he said, you know, we can do the surgery this weekend. Uh, if you're okay with it. And I, I called my hockey coach and he had been talking to my father back and forth without me knowing. And he said, yeah, I think that's what you should do. So I ended up getting the surgery and um, I missed the Majority of the rest of the hockey season, I rushed back, of course, and I played in our last game. We won the we won like the Western New England Conference Championship, whatever it was for Berkshire. Um, but it, the Avon tournament was the last full hockey game I've ever played. At, at the rest of the games I played at Berkshire, even when I moved on to, to college, I never that was the last time I stepped on the ice and felt somewhat I would say confident the, the, the Avon game that morning when everything really hurt was bad but the Friday before was the, the last time I think it was I want to say it was December 3rd 2007 was the last time I fully participated in an on ice practice and I, I, I it sucks to, that it goes so far back because I love the game so much but it's just you know it's I'm kicking myself but it is what it is. I say that all the time. You know, I can't go back and cry about yesterday's. Wow. I mean, that's just like the most insane injury ever. I can't yeah. believe like you were still walking by that point. Like how. I wouldn't call it a walk. I'd call it more of a, uh, a, a little weeble wobble. Oh God. You know? Yeah. Well, do you think if there would have been like more education by your coaches or the prep school or the trainers, anything like that saying like, if you're injured, please come forward. Like, do you I would absolutely, would I, yeah, my, I, my trainer was very good. He was, he was helping me out. I did a lot of electrotherapy that I never did my, my, my Winthrop high school. I mean, I went to four years of Winthrop, graduated four years of Winthrop, but um, our trainers were not, the, you know, the, the trainers that I had at Berkshire, these guys, you know, I went to prep school with Kevin Miller. He played just retired from the Bruins. He was on my team. Um, the, the trainers out there were who they should have been. They did everything they could for their players. Um, when I would go in there, I would tell him that something was hurting, but he, I couldn't really describe it because I didn't know exactly what was going on. You know, he, 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 we'd do stretches. He'd do massage, deep tissue. I'd be doing ice baths, heat treatment, electrotherapy, like I said. Um, I can't solely put the blame on them because more than I could, I'd probably put more blame on myself for undermining the, the pain I was going through. Um, but again, like I said, I never wanted them to know that it was as bad as it was because if, I, if my trainer knew that it was that bad, then I wouldn't be able to play. So I'd come in, you know, I'd pretend that everything was okay, but his, I think his name was Luton. Uh, so we call him Lutz, the trainer. 
And I'd walk in, you know, he's dealing with so many other people at this school, you know, that are doing the same thing that I'm doing. I was, I was no, you know, I wasn't the, the number one person of attention there. He's catering to me as long as, you know, Kevin Miller was there, you know, doing his therapy, whatever it may be. Um, but I, I would absolutely say that if there might have been more dialogue between me and him, you know, in, in a different type of atmosphere, not so much in the trainer's room where there's, you know, he's taping someone's ankle and he's looking at me asking if the stem's too high or too low or, you know, does he need to put more ice in the ice bath? You know, he, he had a lot going on, just like every other trainer does. But, you know, if there would be a time, you know, if you do divulge that you are going through a significant amount of pain, that maybe there should be a time where you can sit down with somebody and they can, you know, ask you more personal questions, maybe deep dive and research on their own end. Uh, not to say that they didn't care, but, you know, an extra five minutes of conversation when it, there's not so much going on, uh, might have, you know, might have, I might have told them, you know, you know, Lutz, it is a little bit worse than what I'm making it up to be, you know, and everything you're doing is helping a little bit, but, you know, it's not doing enough. I was at the point where I go in, I wanted to get it done, and then go down to practice. And that, that's not taking anything away from him. He didn't know, but I mean, I've I played college sports, and there were times where trainers we would, you know, tell the coach, you know, Paul can't practice today. You know, I saw him walking a little a little wrong. I don't like that, but um, of course, everybody can learn a little bit more. Uh, it's but it's not just on other people. It, it, the, at the end of the day, it's you know you got to realize what's going on in your own self to get to that point of the conversation because it's a lot easier to, you know, to fake it till you make it type of deal. But, uh, I mean, intelligence goes a long way, not just saying that you need to know what, exactly what's going on with a particular person, but you can see the signs and then you can sit down, you can have that dialogue. And then from there is when you can kind of attack it in a different aspect. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just even feeling comfortable, like that's one of the biggest things. I think it's starting to get, it has been getting better, especially in recent years, whether Absolutely. it's like mental health or physical health or whatever. Because even some of my teammates, like they would hide the amount of pain mm -hmm. they're in or like if they got a concussion and like, that's bad. Like that's why you have your teammates to like report it now. Like you're yep. obligated to do that. Yeah. Um, and so after you got your surgery, did you... How did you make your decision whether you wanted to continue playing after that in college? So, so after the surgery, um, I made it into, so I knew that hockey season, which I don't want to say it was a wash, but, you know, I lost the, the majority of the hockey season. Um, and then we had baseball season coming. So that was my, I don't want to say it was my backup plan, but it was, it was just as good as a plan, my hockey plan. You know, I, I would have been perfectly fine playing baseball or hockey in college. Um, and then, so after the surgery, after like the, you know, I kind of played a little bit towards the end of the hockey season, uh, I started to try to rebuild, you know, my core a little bit, just so I could go out there and at least show, show face and, um, not necessarily build my stats. Cause I, I had a, I had a good resume for, for college, for baseball when I graduated, went up high. Um, so I knew that wasn't going to be, you know, a make or break, but I still wanted to show. I show up because I, you know, I talked to the baseball coach before I go out there and whatnot. Um, but then the first baseball game that I was able to play completely healthy, uh, I got on first base and I stole second base and ended up dislocating my shoulder. And that was, you know, that's kind of the old ex ex uh, expression, you know, kicking a dead horse. Um, so, I mean, so that happened at that time, at that point, I was so done with being in prep school, being away from my family while being hurt, not being able to go home. Um, and you'll see my cousins, see my parents. Um, but I still, I, I lucked out and uh, I realized that the way my injury was healing, I wasn't going to be able to play to my full capacity on the ice. So after talking, I, I had a couple calls from uh, St. Mike's. Um, my dad thought maybe I could walk on to a couple schools. Um, but I, I knew I didn't want to just you know, give up on my baseball career because I love playing baseball. It's a much different game than hockey. Obviously, it's not as physical. It's not as fast paced. Um, but I was I was a good baseball player. And one of my other buddies from Winthrop who went to Berkshire with me uh, was talking to, to Northeastern. So I decided to, you know, 
put all my eggs in one basket and, you know, I'm going to go to Northeast and play baseball. I had previous conversations with the Northeastern baseball coach when I was at Winthrop, just, you know, rumblings, nothing too extensive. Um, but I figured, you know, let me apply. Let me send my resume to the, the baseball coach as, long, as well as the school for my admissions. And ended up getting in and started spitball with the, the baseball coach. He said, hey, I remember we talked. Uh, you know, you did go to prep school, so we, we did run out of some scholarships. I'm not saying I was going to get a scholarship, but as a coach, you have to kind of put all that stuff out there. You know, this is where I th think you'll stand in our recruiting and whatnot. He goes, but I would love for you to come out. So it was kind of a, a recruited walk-on type of deal. And I had the utmost confidence in myself. I knew my ability, um, not even thinking about my injury, but I knew my baseball capabilities. If I was able to perform my peak, I could absolutely play a Division One baseball from Northeastern. Um, so we get there. And we start doing the fall baseball training, you know, small practices indoors, uh, just getting to know the team, you know, workouts and strength and conditioning and whatnot. And we had our, um, like, uh, we had a physical fitness test, not so much a test, but just like a, um, like one day of just, you know, push up sit ups, sprints, agility testing, stuff like that. And we had to do, I want to say it was like 200 yards under a certain amount of time of suicides back and forth. And I was doing those and I was finished under the, the recommended time or the, what the official time that they wanted us to do. And remember I was sitting there just resting and all of a sudden I had that same feeling when the cortisone shot wore off. My legs started to throb. Um, obviously there was no bruising at this point because it was so abrupt. But I remember I sat down and I laid my legs flat and I remember trying to get up and it felt like, felt like I just ran five Boston marathons and it wasn't exhaustion. It was, it was more so of a pain. And I, I struggled to my feet. I was kind of leaning against the wall. And I remember with the trainer, she was a woman trainer at this time. It was a team of trainers. She came over and asked me what was going on. And I said, you know, I can't really, I can't really feel my legs. So she brought me into the trainer's room. She started just, you know, doing like the bicycle stretch for me. And, and I remember I came clean. I said, you know, I had this injury last year and I explained the whole thing that I just explained to you. And she started doing some stretches and she started hearing some pop noises and stuff. And so come to find out everything that they ended up fixing or said that they fixed with, um, they did like artificial mesh joints and tendons, everything that they fixed completely dissolved and I was back to square one as I was a year prior. So the surgery that they did did not stick. And here I was again, completely helpless. And in a moment where I needed to excel and to be my best. And my body had failed me. And then from this point on, this was where, you know, again, like we spoke before, this is where I just, I kind of gave up and just, you know, I said, you know, my athletic career was done, at least at that point. Made it through the semester, realized I didn't want to be in Northeast anymore. I just didn't want to be a part of that. You know, my, my roommate was playing club hockey. Uh, my other roommate was still playing baseball. So I just, I wanted to, you know, live in my own head. I didn't want to be part of this because hearing them come back and seeing their cleats or their, their hockey bag and whatnot. But then there was a point where Christmas came around where I talked to another family friend who was the coach at Curry College. And he said, hey, Paul, you know, if you're feeling good, I'd love for you to come out and try out for the hockey team. So here I am, do all my rehab, you know, get back in what I think was good enough shape and transfer to Curry. The day before the tryouts, I, I took, you know, I popped a bunch of Tylenol again, taped up my groins. At this point, I bought a special, um, like a compression jock strap. It just, you know, it's like 15 sizes too small for my legs. And it's a hockey player, you know, hockey guys and girls don't have the smallest legs in the world. So you, you put these on, you couldn't feel anything, but you go out there and, you know, I made the team. Never, never got off the, the, um, the elliptical in the bike for the, the rest of the hockey season. I sat there and rode the bike because the trainer knew that I couldn't play anymore. Uh, but I made the team. I practiced once every blue moon, but uh, I knew I knew that I wasn't anywhere 
the, the same talent level as the worst guy on the team. But I, it was good enough for me that I stuck to it. I tried out. I made the team. Um, but again, you know, I, it was, I took myself away from everybody. I was in the trainer's room by myself, just riding the bike. And this went on for that year. And then the same thing I did ne the next year. And then halfway through my June, uh, sorry, my sophomore year at Curry, um, I remember I woke up one day and I said, all right, that's, uh, that's it. I can't, I can't fake it anymore. It, it, it's all done. And I went to the locker room. Well, I talked to my coach first. I, I said, hey, coach, you know, I think this is it. Um, I'm sure you've seen it. And he said, yeah, you know, Paul, I've noticed that, you know, your, your demeanor's gone downhill in the past past year, especially after last year, making the team and not being able to participate in everything. And um, he was like, you know, I respect your decision. I wish it didn't have to be. And I said, you know, thank you, coach. I'm going to talk to the guys before practice today. And I went in front of everybody and said, like any other hockey player would, I said, hey, boys, you know, I'm sorry, I got to hang them up. And I said, you know, if I can't compete at the level that I know I'm capable of competing mentally, but not physically, then I, I can't be a part of it. Because it's 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 almost like I'm teasing myself at this point, and the guys, you know, we went around. They gave me hugs. You know, they asked some questions. You know, what's going on? Because I never told anybody. You know, I obviously just told my trainer. Um, and the guys went on the ice for practice. I cleaned out my locker. It's like something out of a movie. There was just me in the locker room. Cleaned out my locker. Walked out of the rink, and you know, the guys were on the ice. They were doing the the pre the Skating, skating around in circles before practice even started. I walked out of the locker room, put my bag in my car, and drove home. And that was the last time I was ever involved in a collegiate team sport. Um, and that was that was a, that was a tough day. You know, I didn't realize it until a few years ago um, when I when I when I saw somebody out and started talking about all these the problems that was happening since uh, you know prep school and getting hurt, but. When I walked out of that rink, you know, my mind was so shut off that it, it didn't it didn't bother me. You know, I was just it was it. Like you know, it's like you're walking out of a bad movie. When I walked out and, and I drove home, and like I said, that that was it. You know, people asked me well, what happened. Oh, you know, you know, I can't keep up anymore. That I'm all done. Simple as that. But little did I know that all these years of you know me pretending that everything was fine, you know, everything was cool, and I'm I'm a tough guy, you know. Uh, that, that turned into me not wanting to do much of anything. My, my identity was left in that locker room when I walked out of that ring. Yeah. Well, I, I can see why, <laughs> because your life has literally revolved around sports. I mean, it's the athlete identity. Like everyone mm -hmm. at some point has to come to terms with it. Yours just was cut short very, very early. And like, obviously you wouldn't be satisfied with that because of how competitive you were. Um, and so honestly major props to you to actually like stepping away from it because like most people would have probably just like kept being miserable kept going back to the rink and like just suffering through but like you you just pulled a Simone Biles before Simone Biles did it <laughs> yeah uh, well geez all, all right I'll, I'll take that I'll take that yeah. <laughs> I mean like it does take a lot of strength because like that's that was your sport like you love hockey and you always have and you always will but like I can't even imagine the day that like I have to actually step away. Like obviously like I coach and like I'm going to play, but like, you know, you get a little bit of taste of not playing. You're like, Oh my God, like I want it back. Did you ever yeah. have any of that? Uh, I mean, of course. I mean, I still, I, I can still go out there and play pick up hockey, you know, be a league old man hockey on a, on a Monday night or early Wednesday morning with some of the, these guys that I played high school with and, you know, they had careers elsewhere and whatnot. So I, I'm glad that I still have that. I still have the competitiveness in my in my soul, but at at that point when I when I realized that you know my collegiate career, everything that I had worked for from the time when I was five years old, playing when my dad used to freeze over the hockey rink in the backyard when I was a kid, like that. Those were the that was the day that I knew was going to happen. I knew I was never going to be a professional athlete or. or Wayne Gretzky or even or even play triple A or, or over in Europe or something but I knew that I was going to be able to play at a, at, a, at a good level have a good resume be able to have locker room stories and you know road trip stories and be able to live that life that 
a lot of, you know, a lot of athletes never get to live. Uh, again, it goes back to, you know, my dad always making sure that I was going to, you know, be able to play at my best to do all this stuff. And, um, you know, there's no waste of talent thing. You know, I've known kids that I went to school with that had the ability, they just didn't have the heart and they, they gave up just because they didn't want it enough. But I was at the point where I wanted it enough, but I couldn't keep up. And, and, you know, it's just, like you said, making that decision at that time, I didn't really realize the weight that it carried up until a few years ago where I, you know, I dived deep back into the depths of my memories and, and, you know, I still, I can pull up pictures of, of days where I never thought they were going to be go, like get old and, and whatnot. Like when, uh, like I said, when Kevin Miller just retired, he had an, um, he had a special on Nesson where they showed his road to the Bruins and they showed our team picture when, uh, before I got hurt at the beginning of the hockey season, it was Kevin Miller was standing behind me and I was on one knee and I was sitting at a bar with a couple of buddies and everybody started cheering and go, Oh, look at that. There's Paul right there. And, you know, you know, at that time, I could, I never would have imagined that, you know, my career would have been cut short, you know, just a couple of weeks after that picture was taken. But it's something you gotta, you gotta live with. And, you know, it's, I never thought I would put my mental health first when I had to walk out of there. It was just, you know, let's just, let's just go home. That's what I kind of boil it down to. Yeah, definitely. How long after you quit, did you start having like your mental health problems? Like you obviously had it throughout your injury, but like afterwards, didn't it get pretty bad? And so it, 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 it almost started immediately. I was still in school. Uh, I lived with a couple hockey guys that year. Um, one kid stopped playing for, for other reasons and whatnot. Um, but after that, I didn't, I didn't want to go to school anymore. I, I, I just, I, I would go to school, uh, you know, I'd, I'd drive up. I lived, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes away from campus. I'd drive to school, I'd go to class, I'd sit in the back, you know, I'd do doodles in my, my notebook and I, I did the bare minimum just to get it done and get out of there. And then the year after I moved out of that house, after I, after I quit, I ended up living back at home and I started commuting from Winthrop. So it was about a 45 minute ride without traffic to drive to Curry. And I just remember, you know, I, I knew I had to go to school, obviously, you know, my, my parents were helping paying the tuition and all this. So I was at the point where, okay, go to, go to class, go home. That was it. Not pay attention, do the bare minimum. And I started living within my own head. Um, I was, I mean, I, I got into a relationship that, you know, I probably shouldn't have been in, but it was, a, it was another, it was a toxic relationship from, from, from the get-go, I would say. Uh, it was kind of a spur of the moment type of deal. You know, I wasn't in a bad, I was in, I was in a bad place at school. I was in a bad place when I came home. And I just started to drift away from, you know, family events, family members. I was living with my brother at the time when I was finishing my last year. And I come home and I just go in my bedroom and I shut the door and I turn the lights off and I play Call of Duty until 2.30 in the morning and think nothing of it. You know, I knew I was, I knew I was upset. I didn't want to know why I was upset. I didn't want to have that conversation in my own head. Um, I was doing enough in, in public where, you know, nobody would question what was going on. Um, but I literally just started to take myself out of every, every aspect of life that I would have been fully involved in before everything happened. Social events, going out on weekends with buddies, um, going to hang out with my cousins, like all these things that I would normally would do. I just, I'd do it and I didn't want to be there or I just wouldn't go. And, you know, people, you know, family, they start making jokes. Oh, if Paul's flaking again, you know, he's going to say he's going to come. He's not going to come. And usually if, you know, if I heard these rumblings in between my family, I might have like spoke up and said something, you know, as, as like a joke. Cause I mean, guys, you know, like the, crap on each other and whatnot, you know, guys being guys. But I I literally just didn't wanna, I didn't wanna realize who I had become. Cause I, at the same point, I knew what I was doing but I didn't know who I was because why wasn't I going to school and why wasn't I going to practice? You know, that, that was my life for, 
20 years every every day you know you do something you go to school you even in elementary school i go to elementary school i come home we play wiffle ball this my life completely changed when i walked out of that rink and it was it was eating me alive without me really even knowing it i turned a blind eye to a lot of things my family my friends myself um and then and then i graduated uh for in a degree that i i didn't really want i had some interest but um i knew it would have been easy i I went to the uh, graphic design field i like to draw a little bit at the time but i knew that it would be something simple i didn't have to really study too much for get me in get me out call it a day and then uh, i graduated again back to the relationship i realized that i wasn't happy there i started a dead-end job ended up breaking up with my girlfriend quit my job a week later, said, you know what, I'm gonna move to Colorado and dropped everything and I moved to Colorado, thinking that that's gonna rejuvenate me. You know, I'm gonna go out there, I'm gonna ski all the time, you know, have some have some fun, meet some friends. And then when I, when I went out there, that's when it turned into the party scene. Me, you know, me just going to work, drinking, you know, doing drugs, doing things that I never should have been doing, that it was never me, again, post uh, pre-injury, free um, mental health delusion, like, like all these things that, that I was doing was not who I was, but because I was out there and I was alone, I thought that, you know, let me do this. Let me, you know, have some fun. I'll get back on my feet. And then before I knew it, you know, I was, I was running out of money. There was a point where um, I was working construction out there and construction in Colorado in the winter is not the most steady job because they had snowstorms every day. So I was running out of money. I never, I would never call my mother and father and say, hey, I need, I need some help, unless it got really bad. And they would do it in a heartbeat. But there was a point where I would go to work and I was eating 7-Eleven hot dogs and slices of pizza because I had $7 in my bank account and asking it for an advance from, uh, for a paycheck from my construction boss. And that would go to I'd got to get out of work. I'd go down the bar. I'd hang out with some great people. Great people. I'm not saying that they made me do all this stuff, but you know, I'd go to the bar. I'd, I'd drink a bunch. I'd, I'd do some drugs. I'd go home, wake up, do the same thing all over again. And I was so deep in this that I completely forgot everything that I had come from, the upbringing that I had. Um, you know, I was put on a facade for phone calls and and stuff like that. This was before, social media was still kind of social media, but not at the point where it's at now where, you know, it's a lot easier to really connect with somebody uh, as we as we are now. Zoom was, I don't even know if FaceTime was a thing back when I was living out in Colorado. But um, there was always concern from my mother and some other people. But, you know, every phone call, no, everything's okay, everything's fine. You know, just the same thing with the with the injury. No, I'm not, not nothing's wrong, I'm gonna be okay. Uh, just having some fun. Oh yeah, sorry, late night last night or early morning this morning. Um, and then, I, and, and again, the money was really low and I met another girl and I jumped into another toxic relationship without knowing it because I thought it was another escape from where I was at that point. And from there, I jumped over to Kansas City. Uh, that's where she was from. She went to the University of Kansas. And for a short time, you know, things were under control. I started working out again. I started feeling good. I I, uh, I was going to the gym like twice a day. You know, I had a, a steady job. I was working at a dry cleaner at one point just because I wanted to work and stay busy. I was doing bartending. Um, and then we decided to move back to Boston and things were okay. And then, you know, things between myself and her started to fall apart a little bit and I didn't want to face those things. Again, it's all about facing my problems between the injury, you know, my drug problem in Colorado the toxicity of this relationship I was when we moved back to Winthrop. And um, and again, I, I, you know, I went out one weekend and before I knew it, I was back in the, the depths of bad people and down that wrong alleyway. And uh, this went on for a, for a long time. And uh, I'd probably say at least, probably at least six or seven months of, you know, really, really the, the, the darkness of, you know, you know, drug abuse and drinking and, and forgetting all these people around me that love me so much, but going back from a, another dead end job to work, uh, to living with this relationship that 
I didn't want a part of. So I was doing these things to completely forget everything that was really going on. Again, just completely turning the blind eye to the mental pain I was going through at this point, not so much the physical pain. And it got to a head where I started seeing a therapist who actually was the was a, um, a, uh, a speed skating coach or a coach, a hockey coach of some sort of BU, which is a woman, Cindy, uh, out in Hamilton, a little bit north of Boston. And we really started to dive into not what was going on, but why, what got me to the point of why these things were going on. And that was the first point where I realized that I was completely ripped apart from everything that happened in prep school. And I, I realized that I had no idea who I was anymore. Um, I forgot every, just because of, of one injury and one aspect of life, sports, because that was gone, I forgot completely about every other positive in my entire life. My family, I had nephews at this time. Um, I had a dog that I love, you know, just the little things that I look, I look at now that I could never imagine not being here. Whereas I completely ignored all of that when it was there. And I was, you know, I was, again, like I said, I was completely numb to everything that was going on. But then when I talked to this therapist, and like you said, when you were asking me about if the trainers knew how to talk about these certain injuries, when I talked, when I sat down in her office and she knew how to talk to me about these mental injuries that I've had over, over all these years, it was like, it was like peeling layers of an onion. It, it just, everything became smaller and smaller and smaller in my head. When everything, when I would think about all these things, my mind would go so crazy. And that's why I was just kind of, I had so much stress in my head that I didn't want to deal with it. That when I would start to, to, to attack these feelings and these emotions and these memories one at a time, and you, you know, you check one off the list. But if you have a checklist and you go down and you attack these things one at a time and you take a deep breath between every one, it was the, every, every time we talked, the clouds would disperse a little bit more. And it all boiled down to, you know, being vocal about what I was going through so long ago. And I don't want to say that if, I don't want to say I had regrets because if I had regrets, and that means I would change something that I did. But here I am right now talking to you and I have a beautiful house, I have a beautiful fiance, I have a, I have a life, all these things. So I can't necessarily say I regret doing everything that I did, but if there was one thing that I wish I attacked more, it was being open about what I was really feeling when I was, and when it was 2007 and here I am 33 years old. And when I was going through all this with the realization with my therapist, I was 30. Uh, probably 29, 30. And I, I realized I wasted so many years thinking that if I ran away to other states or got in a different relationship or met another group of people, that it was all gonna magically go away. But sitting there and having those conversations, it, it is, it was the most, first of all, it was the most upset I've ever been in my entire life, completely sobbing, just acceptance is amazing but it's also heartbreaking at the same time. And when I realized what I did and what I ignored, it was it was like a, the light switch was turned back on. Like I said, I was in the darkest alleyways during all this. And then, you know, the expression, oh, you see the light. Well, yeah, I, well, she made me see the light and it was all based on just realizing what I was going through emotionally and mentally and not even physically. Because you can know the physical pain as much as you want because that's just physical, but you're telling yourself to ignore it. So that's all mental. So this all, I guess that came to a head, uh, yeah, four years ago and three, yeah, three years ago. And it was just having the, having a conversation, but people, people it's so underappreciated just having a conversation with somebody, just letting it all out. And like, like as we are right now, it's, it's still, you, you know, I, I ramble, but I still say things now that I never said two years ago or three years ago when I was talking to my therapist. And it, it yeah. goes away. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I love therapy. It's, <laughs> I recommend it to everyone. Um, just because like, like you said, getting it out of your head. Cause that's 
of what mm -hmm. it is a lot of time depression anxiety obviously like these are disorders but there's always something underlying that's causing it plus mm -hmm. the imbalance of hormones and whatnot yeah um and when you what made you decide to finally get help what was that turning moment uh well it was like any other uh, any other addict or somebody who's you know like i said the, in the, the of the path of values um it, i had the realizations but i never wanted to accept it um until my mother and my sister pulled me aside at different times and said you need help and like like again like no no addict wants to to realize that that's where where it, it's come to but I would do anything for, I'd do anything for anybody. But when my mother sat me down and she, she grabbed my hands and she had tears in her eyes and she said, you need to do this. I still had trouble accepting the fact that I needed to, even though I knew I did. Um, but she, she came over and she said, you need to go get help. And, you know, with a little bit of, you know, a little kick in the ass, I decided that I absolutely needed to, whether, whether I was going to go on my own or whether my brother was going to have to come, my brother, my brother-in-law, my family, they were going to make sure that I went and got help. And I went away to a, uh, a small rehab in Connecticut. I was there for a couple of weeks and that helped me more so with, you know, the, the drug addiction and, and the alcohol and all this other stuff. Uh, that was with the therapy there, but the thing that helped me most was we had our group conversations and there was at one point where I told the story that I just told you. And one of the other kids said like jokingly, but you know, agreeingly, he said, Oh man, that's depressing. And I remember he said that to me and I went back to my room that night and down when I was away at mountainside, they, there was no cell phones, no TVs. It was books in your mind, books, notebook paper, you know, colored pencils. Um, like non, they were all stimulants that you had to do on your own. And I remember I was lying in bed and I was recapping everything that I said and recapping everything that happened in my entire life from when I was in diapers to when I got hurt to where I was at lying in that bed. And I said, holy shit, I'm, I'm severely depressed. Not right at that moment, because I felt good at that moment, but just recapping everything I went through with the injury and loss of identity. I said, okay, I, I, I need help for depression. And the next day I went to, the, we had our morning meetings with everybody. And I said, you know what, guys, you know, I'm depressed. And everybody started clapping. You know, you go to AA and they say, hey, I'm Paul and I'm a colic. Everybody starts clapping. And these guys and these girls and these counselors and directors, everybody started clapping. And it was, again, somebody lifted a boulder off my back. It was the first, one of the, the first moment at that time, at that peak where I realized that this was a step that I made. I made that decision for myself. I didn't make the decision necessarily to go to rehab. Yeah, I was, like I said, I was kind of kicked in the ass to go. But when I told myself I was depressed, it was, it was an epiphany. And um, the place I was at, they, they didn't necessarily specialize in that type of mental health. They, met, they specialized more so in, you know, substance abuse and things like that. So after conversations with my mother and my counselor there, uh, we made the decision that I was going to leave and get uh, more counseling at a place in the North Shore in Beverly, uh, where I would sit down and I would go through, you know, conversations of, okay, well, what happened? What got you to make this realization? Where do you want to go from here? And I was so open at that point and so uh, in tune with myself and my memories. And, and it was, it was like, you push a snowball down a hill. And the more, the more I would go to this, this, uh, therapist, we were talking and, you know, I would take these tests and, and all this stuff. Um, it, it just, it came to a point where I could see clearly, uh, first of all, first of all, I was healthy. I was thinking clearly, I was feeling better about myself. Um, I was feeling feeling so, I mean, so much better about myself that I wanted to figure out more what was going on with me, where I wanted to dive deeper and deeper and figure out what got me to that point. What can I do? Realizing I'm never going to be, you know, that 18 year old 
Division One prospect anymore, and getting to the point of okay, well, I'm a 30 year old Paul Rizzioni. Um, I'm going to take the civil service test. I'm going to become a firefighter, and you know the the the, the wheels just got tighter, and I just kind of ran with it, and and I and, and here I am three years later. I mean, it's been the greatest you know year of my life. I went you know another tough two years waiting to be a firefighter in the first two years, you know, being in the pits at the firehouse and whatnot, but, you know, making those realizations that I'm not who I used to be. I'll never be who I, who I used to be. Uh, you know, I'm a different person right now than I was when me and you first started this conversation. Uh, and tomorrow morning, the biggest decision I need to make is, you know, what, what socks I'm going to put on. I was so consumed about everything in my life that I could not control you know, what people thought about me, you know, you know, is this the, is this my last relationship? Is this a job that I want to have? You know, uh, why can't I do the back to the injury? Why can't I do the certain workout anymore? You know, this isn't who I want to be. And more of the acceptance aspect, like I said, of this is who I am. And I lost that for years of not knowing who I was. And and just looking at myself every day and realizing that I can only get make myself better, you know, talking and being vocal, uh, having a good support system, having you know good relationships at the, at the at work, at home, even when, like when you go to the grocery store and you just acknowledge people, you know, I I didn't do that I didn't do that for so many years because I didn't know who I was, so I didn't want to pretend that I was going to be something. I mean, you can't be somebody who you don't even know. I'm trying to figure out how to explain this. You can't be who you are if you don't know where you came from. So I know where I came from. I know I'm never going to be at that point. And I'll just, I'm just going to try to take it one day at a time. And I'm just very happy with everything that kind of how it turned out. Sorry, I kind of yeah. made it. But, no, um, you're good. <laughs> I mean, you definitely turned it around. I didn't know you back then, but I know you now. And you're like a great person. So oh, thank you. And if you think about it, like, I know you're <laughs> upset that you just started the process of unraveling everything or like three years ago, four years ago. But if life were five 20 year segments, you're only on the second one. Yeah. So you've got plenty of time. Like at least you're not doing this when you're 60, 70 years old. No, and that's very true. You've got yeah, your I, life to live. I say that to everybody, you know, just I have friends that, you know, their, their parents got divorced or they went through these relationships and, you know, they just say, oh, oh whatever, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. But, you know, I thought the same thing for so long. So, I mean, I'll tell everybody, you know, if I start asking you too many questions, they get upset with it's because I think maybe there's something that you want to say, but you just don't want to say it yet. Because I've been there, I'm, I'm sure you have, I know plenty of people who have, and it just, it, it, eat, it eats at you if you just... You know, don't be, no judgment. I mean, yeah, there's people out there, there's trolls, there's people that are going to judge, but those are the people that don't matter. They don't, don't affiliate yourself with those people. You ignore them. As, as easy as it sounds, you know, it's, it's tough, but, you know, get yourself a good support group, you know, talk to a therapist. It's the, the, the greatest people in the world because they will sit there and they will listen to you talk and cry and laugh and yell for hours. And then they'll say, all right, what else is going on? You know, they're not going to, you know, rip you apart or anything like that. And, you know, those are the, like I said, the toxic relationships that I was in, you know, that's where I got myself, you know, it just became a, you know, head to head, you know, button heads and whatnot. And, you know, find a good support group, talk to somebody, just, just be, be yourself as much as you can, but, you know, you got to have a, a good ear to lean on once in a while. Yeah, definitely. What do you think is the biggest obstacle for men looking to get help right now? Oh, well, all guys are too tough. Every guy, you know, I don't cry, you know, I don't, you know, I can't cry. No, that's what I'm saying. Uh, guys, guys will say that. Oh, guys don't cry. No, I, I cry. If, I, if, if you give me a sad dog video, um, the water, the water faucets are on. Um, <laughs> but no, it's, a, it's what guys, you know, the term, Boys being boys, or boys will be boys. You know, there was some there was some arguments about that because of, of a commercial a while ago. But I, I see both sides because when I was a when I was a boy, boys would be boys. Like I said, we would come in with a bloody nose and, and whatnot. But 
you know, when you, you get to a certain age and you, you start learning more about yourself, you start learning more about life, about the, your values and what it takes to be a good man. Being a good man does not mean that you're not allowed to say you need help. And whether that's, you know, you need to help changing a, a tire or building a roof or whatever it may be, you know, a phone call, you know, you, if you need help, make a phone call. I tell all my cousins and we, we're very, we're very open about it now. Whereas kids, you know, we, the guys don't talk about that stuff. We talk, guys don't say I love you. You and my cousins say I love you all the time. You know, even when we leave in the backyard, you know, a little fist bump and a, hey, I love you. But um, the biggest thing for, I mean, for guys nowadays, media and social media, you know, if you see it on TV and you see these, you know, these not so much as of, as of like extremely recently, but you know, you got the, you know, football players, hockey players, these guys go out there, they put on these personas. Um, like, look at, like, the hockey players that used to be bruises and fighters back in the day that would just go out there and fight every day. And, you know, unfortunately, we lost a lot of them to suicide or to mental health issues or whatever it may be. But to just, if you have a good, again, I'm going to say against a good support group, that will, you know, might have to poke and prod at you and a little kick in the ass, like I was telling you that my mother gave me. Sometimes you need to find somebody who's going to lean into you a little bit and tell you what they think, tell you how it is, and and it draw it out of you. Uh, it's not easy for a lot of guys. I know plenty of guys that have a lot of problems that still tell me that everything's fine, but I know when they go home, they're miserable. Um, I hope one day that they'll get it and they'll understand that there's nothing wrong with saying that you know, you're depressed or, or you're, you're having these, ba these bad thoughts or, you know, you, you, is that why you drink every day? I know guys that go out and they drink every day and they think it's funny and other people think it's funny, but, but I mean, as an outsider looking in and, you know, being at that point uh, in my life at one point, I'm, I would imagine that there's something else going on, um, but they don't want to, like I said, they don't want to show that there's something eking at them in their, their head or they're unhappy in their relationship or they're not happy with their job or, you know, it, it, acceptance, the, the word acceptance goes a long way. If you, if you're a guy or a girl or, or whoever, whoever you may be, if you, if you can tell yourself honestly that you, that something is wrong, that you, you're unhappy, um, then just, you know, reach out, you know, make a text message or go for a walk or things like that. But when it comes to guys, like you said, it's a lot tougher than, you know, I guess just, I, I know guys that just don't want to admit that there's something wrong, like I did. But sometimes you gotta, you know, and you, it's a lot easier to push off rock bottom when you're hitting rock. And I hope that guys don't have to get to that point, but I feel like if there's more conversation, there's, there's better social groups, you know, you're surrounding yourself with good people. I think men are starting to come around to it more. You look like Michael Phelps, uh, you look at these guys on such a level, you know, these quarterbacks and, and stuff like that. I think we need role models that aren't just the guy around the corner or your buddy from high school, because it, it takes somebody looking up to, to realize that, you know, it's okay to be not okay. So I think I mean it's gonna it's gonna take a while for for guys to realize that it's it's okay to feel emotional and feel upset. Um, and I think it's just you know it's just evolution of guys being guys just thinking that they don't need to say that anything's wrong. So I I mean I hope to God that they can realize that someday that they can say something just like any other female or or child or adult or grandparent. It, it doesn't matter age or sex or, or whatever. It's just what you're feeling. Yeah, for sure. I think the times are changing too, as we've seen, like Kevin Love, um, the goalie for Vegas, I believe, too, has come out. He has his own mm -hmm. mental health foundation. Athletes all around the world, Naomi Osaka, we have yep. Simone Biles. Like, that's huge. Not even just for, like, us who have played sports, but also just little kids that – probably will never pick up, probably are going to be in like arts and crafts and express themselves in different ways. But like them speaking up about mental health and making a big deal out of it because it is, is changing the narrative already. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 
So we've been talking for a long while already. So I have one more question that All I'll right. ask you. And it is, if you have one piece of advice for the next generation of athletes, what would it be? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> one piece of advice. Oh, I would say, make sure you do what you love. And, and again, like I said, the whole wasted talent thing. Um, if you don't feel like it's going to be a waste, then that means you don't love it. Um, yeah, you could say that you might be the best at something if you ever did it, but for upcoming athletes, make sure you make sure you want to do it. If you don't, I'm sure it's so hard to speak up to a parent because when I was a kid, I could never imagine not necessarily raising my voice, but um, speaking up to my father or my mother, even though I did when I when I quit football before high school, my dad was very mad and I, I dug my toes in and I, I quit. And I remember it was in eighth grade right before and I cried and he came down after because he was so, he was not disappointed. He was, he was upset that I didn't want to, but when he came down after the conversation was done and I was still crying on the couch. He said, well, I'm not going to make you do something you don't want to do. So for younger athletes, do what you love until you don't want to do it. And then just have that conversation. You know, I would, I would hope that anyone's parents would be understanding. Um, I, I, again, I mean, it's a, it's a big world. There's a lot of people out there that don't think the same way I do. But if, you, if you're not in love, don't force yourself because it's only going to eat at you. And yeah, you might be good at it, but you're not going to get as much out of it as somebody who might not be as good as you who wants to be there. So just, you know, stick the guns, dig your heels in and, and speak up. Great. I love your, your sayings. <laughs> I know, I know. I get it from my dad. He's a motivational speaker. <laughs> yeah, he is. That's for sure. Well, Paul, thank you so much for being on today. I loved hearing your story and you had some great lessons to share. So I'm excited for everyone to get to hear it. All right. Well, I really appreciate it. Hopefully I didn't ramble too much and my, my Boston accent didn't uh, confuse anybody out there. <laughs> well, there you have it. Thanks so much for tuning in today on the Unpaved Path. If you found this episode helpful or enjoyable, we'd love for you to share it with a friend. To get podcast updates, you can subscribe here or follow me on Instagram at ray.rust. Have a happy hump day.